This is Legislature's The Inside Story, and I'm your host, Tim Story, CEO of the National Conference of State Legislatures. On this episode, we talk with Charlie Cook. Charlie founded the Cook Political Report in 1984. The report is an independent, nonpartisan newsletter analyzing American politics, and it's an absolute must-read for anyone who's serious about tracking what's truly happening in U.S. government elections. He retired as the publisher and editor role in 2021, handing that off to his outstanding colleague, Amy Walter. He remains a regular contributor to what is now called the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. He's busier than ever keeping a keen eye on the elections and traveling the nation to share his insights with various groups. Thanks for joining me for this conversation with Charlie Cook. There used to be an ad campaign that probably not everyone recalls about an investment firm called E.F. Hutton. In this ad campaign, it was really pretty genius. The voiceover would say, when E.F. Hutton talks, everybody listens. Now, I suspect, Charlie Cook, that this has been applied to you. Because for decades, when Charlie Cook talks, everybody listens in Washington. And and I know that you get all kinds of accolades, but I just want to say, I think that's absolutely true. You are the platinum standard or titanium standard, whatever's above platinum, of people who truly spend time and think about how Washington works and what's going on in elections. So, Charlie Cook, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks, Tim. We're going to talk about the election, and you're going to, with all the sort of standard caveats that we only know what we know now, now, and there's still, a, what, five, just a little less than five weeks to go until the midterm elections. And, you know, of course, it can't go fast enough for most most folks, uh, either because they're they're sick of seeing ads in some competitive place, or they're the candidates who just, like, want to get their lives back, or at least some version of their life back, or they're the people who do the analysis, like yourself. You grew up in Louisiana, is that right? Yeah, Shreveport in the uh, upper northwest corner of Louisiana. Culturally, it was more more similar to Arkansas and Texas than it was Louisiana because we were so, you know, 300 odd miles away from New Orleans and not that less uh, to Baton Rouge. So it was not in the Louisiana south of I-10 that most people think of Louisiana. So uh, let me just guess, you were uh, you were in what, probably, I don't know, fifth grade, fourth grade, and you said, you know, someday I want to grow up and move to Washington and become the preeminent person to analyze American politics. Was that that how you wound up in D.C.? I was a high school debater and used to use the uh, library at a law firm, a friend of my father's, and got recruited to help out my senior high school to help do, uh, do some research work for a guy from my uh, a former state rep, state senator, who had just lost a governor's race uh, in Louisiana, Bennett Johnston, and he was running for the U.S. Senate. And so I got recruited to help out doing research. I had gone to Georgetown High School debate camp two summers in a row, and that's sort of when I got bit by the, the Washington and the political bug. But that 1972 Senate race was my first campaign. So you were a forensics guy, and you were doing... With, 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 I actually was a... I, for a, a hot minute, I was a debate coach at a local high school. I was the assistant to the, the very successful real debate coach. So I know a little bit about it. So was it... Was it CX back then? Was it it's called cross exam where you like take an issue and you back and forth? And yeah, most of the time it well they had standard and cross X, and you know your first year or two you were generally doing standard, and then we went to to cross X. But it, it was really helpful because to me, you know, besides getting confidence and learning how to speak and looking how to research and how to organize thoughts, there's you know there's all of that, but you have a debate topic. I don't know if they still do it this way or not, but for the entire year, half the time you're debating the pro side and the other half the con side, you come to realize that all of truth and justice and everything generally not exclusively on one side. You get to kind of appreciate that things are a lot more complicated than it seems, or today that you'd say than it seems on cable television. You know, after I started interning on Capitol Hill, working up there while I was in school, you find there are people that you completely disagreed with who could be really nice people. And there are people on your side that you really agreed with who are just really reprehensible human beings. And there's not that much of a pattern. You learn to sort of separate out partisanship and ideology from what somebody's like uh, as a person. So between the, the debate, the learning both sides and 
just sort of getting to meet. And this is back when both sides really interchange interacted a lot. You know, lots and lots and lots of our friends were, you know, were from the other side. I, I grew up, you know, sort of working for a conservative Democrat. You know, at one point we were our office was across the hall from the offices of Senator Edward Brooke, who was a, a liberal African American Republican senator from Massachusetts. And and he and my boss didn't vote alike much at all, uh, because the Republican was a lot more liberal than the Democrat was. But you had that. Uh, that was you know, before the era of ideological sorting, where the parties, you know, went from ideologically diverse parties to uh, pretty monolithic parties that that sort of lose the moorings. The people that used to keep a party from drifting off into crazy land, um, some a lot of them are gone now from from each side. We know, of course, the brand, the Cook Political Report. I mean, it's the economist brand. You have given the world some fantastic journalists. Early on, I, you know, I started it and it was just me. And then gradually got one person, one, you know, started building. And early on, I did everything. But later on, the key is find people that can do that better than you can. And, and, uh, and, then, and then get to the point size-wise where they can specialize. You know, a David Wasserman, the house editor of the Cook Report, and he does a great cosmic political environment talk. It is very, very good. But he can just zone in on the house in a way that uh, far better than I ever could or even my counterpart and good friend Stu Rothenberg. You know, we were doing the house, the Senate, president. We were doing everything. And you can't do any of it as well unless you're, you've got a certain amount of specialization. When did you go to Washington? Like, when did you literally go in 72, 73? 1972, September 72, and then left a year and a half ago. We had uh, spent five months during the lockdown at a a small little uh, summer place that we had in Maine and decided we didn't want to go home. So we came back to Washington and put our house on the market and packed it up and sold it and then went up there and then found a a house house. And uh, but I'm spending. Uh, what we were talking before the show started, uh, I left left town what four days ago, and I don't see Maine again till October twenty seventh. So it's a lot of road time. You've been this cycle for, I mean, you know, for fifty years, and of course, the only I guess the only saving grace is it's every other year. It's nice to step back and to not be in the the daily rat race, and to not get pulled into a lot of little things that sort of distract you. And, uh, you know, something about sitting out, you know, sitting on the patio and looking out the ocean and you can think great thoughts. Some of my fondest memories last year was uh, walking the dog and thinking great thoughts down a, down a country road. Yeah. We should all, we should all aspire to that. And uh, in fact, we should all just do that period. Cause there's a road somewhere near you where and there's a dog waiting to be walked and there are great thoughts waiting to be thought. So, 50 years in Washington, lots of change, right? I mean, and, and I know surely you've been tossed this question before. You know, you're there 50 years, you, you move, you got a, I assume, a little different perspective now, thinking great thoughts, walking the dog. How do you uh, frame D.C.? How do you characterize the changes in Washington and where we are today? It's just totally, totally differently. And obviously it has a lot to do with partisanship. There was a, a huge overlap between the two parties. And there were better relationships. And, uh, you know, the congressman from my home district back in those days, back when I was growing up, was uh, for a long time was Joe Wagner, who was a, a conservative Democrat, but was known as Nixon's favorite Democrat in the House. There was just a lot more socialization. It was before Washington Congress became a Tuesday, Thursday club. You could have members of Congress from different parties, different parts of the country that you know, their kids would be in school together on soccer teams together. And they used to go on foreign junkets that, yeah, maybe in some ways they may have been a little bit of a waste of money, but that was where these members got to know each other. And you don't know somebody till you travel with them and get to understand what makes them tick. I've often thought that Congress would be benefit greatly if every freshman member was required to go with the group of freshmen on a around the world trip, you know, get an Air Force plane and stop and get briefings all over the world and get to meet each other, know each other and learn something about the world. And you can't get your committee assignments until after you've done that. 
and just hold your hold your committee assignments hostage. The House, you know, it's a majority rule institution. And so you could have, I mean, the, the partisanship makes it less pleasant, but the place could still work. But you didn't see that in the Senate at all. But as you started seeing more House members coming over, moving over the Senate, they were like bringing this contagion with them. And the U.S. Senate, with its rules and procedures and traditions, it can't deal. It can't function with that kind of partisanship. So it was like a contagion coming from one body and entering another body. You know, I, I don't think the Senate's a functional institution anymore. You know, I think that's unfortunate. And uh, because I, you know, I, I happen to think that back before they changed the rules, you know, if you wanted to filibuster something, it's go ahead. Let's see how big your bladder is. You know, see how important this is to you and just let it run. And uh, but when they change the rules and, you know, just simply using the F word filibuster and you could bring something to a halt. That was sort of the beginning of the end and lowering thresholds for confirmations and all kinds of things like that. So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking if, if that's the contagion, how do I vaccinate state legislatures? You know, not me personally, but how do we collectively vaccinate state legislatures from this? Before it's too too late, and I think part of it is we're we we're, we're, we got to hit harder on this you know this civility going on you know getting together. I don't know if they can you know maybe they go out of the state you know maybe it's home stays you know <laughs> like you're going to go stay for a weekend with the other sides. I I mean I think I think what really set things off this direction was uh, I mentioned a little while ago the loss of ideological diversity, you know the importance of Democrats having plenty of conservatives. So Republicans have a plenty of liberals. So there being moderates that are running for office and working in campaigns and giving money and most importantly, voting in primaries. When the two parties became more ideologically cohesive, it started getting more and more us versus them and self-righteous and sanctimonious and the old idea of agreeing to disagree. My friend who passed away a few months ago, uh, Mark Shields, used to say, I'd rather belong to a church that uh, a tr- that seeks converts than one that drives out heretics. You know, increasingly we're seeing in each party a strive for purity and that anybody that doesn't own the party line is ostracized, is, is you know, driven out of the party or marginalized or whatever. And, you know, whether it's on the elected official side and, and then for the voter side, if you just get to the point where you're, Your party is just nominating people that are so far away from you. If you're a Republican, so far to your right, or if you're a Democrat, so far to your left, you you stop participating in primaries and then it becomes more self-fulfilling. And when you have two parties that don't agree on policy in any, you know, any kind of significant policy and they just simply have different values. A friend of mine, uh, Virginia State Senator Dave Marsden, we were talking one time and he said, think about the last line, of the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. You know, for conservatives, they put the emphasis on on liberty and freedom and self-reliance and pull yourself up. And Democrats, you know, that's conservatives and Republicans and liberals and Democrats put uh, justice, fairness, leveling the playing field. We're both supposed to be like and respect both of those values, both of those values. But each side sort of takes one and, you know, all but ignores the other. It takes us to a, to a bad place. This is just such a great conversation that we need to have much longer. But I, but I, I know there are people who are listening who are like, okay, Charlie's going to tell us what it looks like on November the 9th. Of course, we probably won't know on November the 9th, as you know, it'll probably be November the 16th or the 20th or something. But, um, What's your 30,000 foot view? And then we'll drill down on a couple of, of uh, narrow things. I had an English professor in college that was asking the, the, the students, to, you know, kind of rhetorically, OK, what was this story or whatever? What was it about? What was its aboutness uh, uh, making up a word? And, and I think that's actually sort of the key of this election is what's it about? Back until sometime in the first half of the summer, it was a very narrowly focused spotlight, like midterm elections tend to be, on the party in power, President, President Biden and the Democratic majority in Congress. It stayed the course versus time for a change. 
it was behaving almost entirely like every midterm election we've ever seen. And then you had several unrelated developments that I think effectively took that spotlight and widened it into more like a floodlight. It was still illuminating, you know, President Biden and the Democrat Congress, and did they overreach or did they overpromise, and what kind of mistakes did they make on the economy? Broadened out to be a floodlight so that it was not only about Biden, but former President Trump started getting lit up and part of it. It was not just about the economy, but also about abortion. It was also about January 6th and election to nine. And it went from being a referendum to something of a choice election, which is certainly good for Democrats and, and not what Republicans would want. I don't think this election, it was unrealistic to expect it to stay as good as it had been for Republicans. But I think Democrats, it, this thing didn't, tar- it turned in their general direction. It got better for them, but that uh, it's still, you know, you still have a president with a job rating of 43%. You know, there's roughly where President Clinton's were at this point before the 94 disaster that Democrats had. The economy still is terrible. And while individual components may get better. Gas prices came down, but other prices went up and interest rates. And, you know, I I still think that Democrats have a bit of a headwind here, but it's not 50 miles an hour uh, headwind that it had been at one point. It's sort of gone from a really strong, you know, tailwind for Republicans, headwind for Democrats to more of a swirling around. So Republicans, I still think it's very likely that they pick up a majority in the U.S. House, for example, but, and they were never going to get the 40, 50, 60, you know, whatever seats, uh, 70, I think Newt at one point said it could be 40 to 70, or I think McCarthy said 60. Well, that was never going to happen, but realistically it could have been 30, 35, something like that. And now I think it's single digits or low teens with some small, small chance of Democrats holding on, but it's flattened out. And the U.S. Senate, the fact that Democrats, no net change, they effectively win. And Republicans have to pick up one. And when each side has 45 seats that are either not up or safe, and they're 10, 5 from each side, you know, I think that does give, give Democrats a very small edge in terms of majority in the Senate. You know, the thing is that, that because of the strong, strong partisanship we have, where you've got Basically, 45 percent of the vote is locked in nationally for Democrats and 45 percent for Republicans. You know, what that means is that each side starts off basically five points out of a majority so that there are very few cases where in even remotely competitive states uh, or districts where anybody's able to build out a big lead. You said something a minute ago about how back in the summer, you know, it did look like this is going to be classic, time for a change, midterm raw, legislatures in the midterms, um, back to 1900, you've heard me say this a number of times, only twice as the party holding the White House gained seats in legislatures. That trend is almost the same for Congress, I think they maybe have three times. Is it is there more of an X factor this time? I mean, is that because every election, I assume in the last few weeks, you know, it could swing one way or the other, but but you always know this is where it's headed. Five weeks out, ten weeks out. Are, are you? Do you have? Is the X factor higher this time around with five weeks to go? Yeah, I mean, I just think that there's just so many races that are two, three, four, five points that you know that last gust of wind either direction. I mean, for example, 2020, after President Trump did so badly in that September 29th debate, you know his numbers, Republican numbers around the country, they just plummeted. And all this talk of the blue wave and all that. And then that last 10 days, two weeks, I think for a lot of the pure independents and and undecided started thinking about blue wave. Democrats are going to build up a bigger majority in the House and the Senate with room to spare and Biden's going to win big. And what the heck was that Democratic socialism we were hearing about? Defund the police and all these things. And I think, you know, the end of the day, by slight margin, they voted to to replace President Trump with President Biden, but they were willing to give Biden the keys to the car, but not a full tank of gas and a credit card for fear that you know Democrats would would would, would go too far. 
in that election, you went from where every Republican strategist I know was bracing themselves for a hell of a loss, that there were Republicans won every single House seat that was rated toss up in that U.S. House, every single one of them. That's where that last gust of winds for the races that are already close. Something happened late. And given how many people are voting earlier, late starts earlier than it than it used to. But that last gust of wind can make all the difference in the world in a lot of races. So that begs the question. I don't know how you do it if you study the entrails of animals or you you know look at the stars. But um, what does your spider sense tell you about the gust of wind? The thing is, if you say what what did give Democrats that that win back then? Well, it was it was the the Dobbs decision. It was gas prices going down by a buck. It, you know, it was Democrats got some stuff through where they had, had gone through a real dry period. So when I look from here to November eighth, I don't see macro events that are likely to help the democratic cause but on the for but you know i think there's a lot of economic news and things that have a clearly bigger downside risk for democrats between now and then republicans are using very skillfully the crime issue the thing is they're taking advantage of people remembering that defund the police and granted only you know only a small number of crackpots in the democratic party ever bought into that but it got tattooed on the entire party. That crime issue, you know, I think there are most people, I think, could point to some heinous thing that happened last six months in their hometown or whatever they find horrifying and that they don't remember things like that. We forget that people's decision making on this stuff is all to do with emotion and perspective has very little to do with data, right? So who knows if crime is up or down? It certainly seems that way, right? Yeah, violent crime rate is up in the last couple of years. Now, maybe related more have more to do with the pandemic than President Biden or something. You know, but the fascinating thing I was thinking when you were talking a little while ago, and we talked about this before, the fact that the president's party has only gained state legislative seats twice in the since 1900. The fact that in the U.S. House or Senate, somebody can get tattooed, well, he's a tool of President so and so. You could have legislators that have never been east of the Mississippi River having their races enormously affected. Why should they be blamed for Washington? And that's why I think it's turn that that what it is more is it's turnout. And that when you are a member of a president's party, you might be happy or satisfied, you might be complacent, you might be a little disappointed, you may be deeply disillusioned, but you're really going to be ecstatic and feeling like, you know, I can't wait to go out. We won two years ago and I can't wait to go out and vote again. That's not very common. And meanwhile, the op- members of the opposition party, members lean or people lean to, they're madder in hell that they lost two years ago. They hate everything that's happening. They want revenge. They're hyper motivated. And then you have the narrow little 10 percent that are the pure independents. They tend to be a fickle lot and they tend to get buyer's remorse. And who the heck knows what they intended when they voted for a party two years earlier, but they're almost always disappointed or angry at them. I think for 90% of the electorate, 90%, it's, it's, it's about relative turnout between the two sides. And for the 10% in the middle, how, how mad are they and at who? For each side, it's like, okay, what can go wrong between now and election day? And when you're the party in power, there's just a hell of a lot more that can go wrong for you. I think there's still a Republican edge, but it's not where it was, at least in the House, which is the U.S. House and let's say state legislative. I think Republicans are more likely to have a better better night than Democrats. But in the Senate, the U.S. Senate is a lot more idiosyncratic, where individual races, candidates uh, matter enormously. And let's face it, Republican primary voters did not do their party's favors. Maybe that's where we leave it. From, uh, you know, from the, the deepest uh, place I've got, I really appreciate it. Thank you again, Charlie. Can't wait to see you again. Well, that's very kind of you. But uh, and NC, NCSL does so much for best practices. You know, there are 50 states and each one's a laboratory. And you guys are able to basically communicate out and get out where 
ideas and things and practices that have worked one place and could just as easily be leveraged up to 49 other places. It's a vital part of the process. That That's great. I, I appreciate that endorsement. And we're going to stick to that. And we'll try to schedule a, sometime well well into the future when you've done your post-election rounds. And we both caught up on sleep. That's Charlie Cook of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Legislatures, the Inside Story. I'm Tim Story, the CEO of the National Conference of State Legislatures. Go to ncsl.org to hear other interviews on podcasts that we produce and to tap into the wealth of resources we have for lawmakers and legislative staff and everybody else on major issues that legislatures are confronting in the states and territories. Thanks for listening to our podcast. We encourage you to review and rate NCSL Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, or Spotify. We also encourage you to check out our other podcasts, Our American States, and the special series, Building Democracy.